Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Nick Saplina, Senior Vice President at Everytown for Gun Safety. Nick, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's a really important conversation, but before we dive in, can you explain what is Everytown? Uh, Everytown for Gun Safety is the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country. Uh, we operate at the federal, state, and local governments and have a presence in, in every state in the country. We advocate for the kind of common sense gun laws that almost all Americans agree uh, are can save lives. And we do that uh, through a series of uh, actions, but most importantly through our grassroots, through our Moms Demand Action, Students Demand Action, and Survivor Networks. If almost all Americans can agree that common sense gun laws are necessary, are important, and are life-saving measures in this country, why aren't they enacted? Well, I guess the first part of my answer to that is they are enacted in, in, a, in a lot of places, and we've seen enormous progress over the last decade with states adopting the, the, the policies that, that we support that we know can make a difference. But your larger question is really about why aren't they being enacted at the rate and at the federal level at the rate that we, we want them to. And, and the answer is pretty simple. Um, there's a very powerful gun lobby in this country that has convinced politicians that there's no room uh, for disagreement here. That calculus is changing, and we're helping to change that calculus by activating Americans across the country in blue, purple, and red states to, to send a message to their, their elected officials uh, in the federal government and elsewhere that like they're just not going to stand for it anymore. Um, and a great example of that was last year, we passed the first uh, major uh, federal legislation in a generation, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, and in fact got 15 Republican senators to sign on to that bill. So, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. The forces of opposition are really strong and really entrenched, um, but we are making progress. I do want to touch on the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act in just a little bit, but the reason I did call you today is because the country is once again reeling from a mass shooting this time in Maine. This is the single deadliest mass shooting in all of 2023. What's your response? Well, I, you know, it's like I'm in disbelief, but not surprised that once again, an American community has been decimated by gun violence. Once again, a night that should have been fun at a, at a bowling alley or a restaurant uh, has turned into a war zone and turned into a war zone uh, created by a gun lobby that has found it fit to market and sell weapons of war to civilians. Um, you know, every single senseless tragedy, including what we saw in Maine, serves as a public service announcement to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Uh, this is the result of inaction and delay. Uh, and this is what happens when you have weak gun laws. One of the first uh, news stories I've ever covered, a breaking news story at the beginning of my career, was the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. That shooting paired with shootings in Nashville, Uvalde, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, among others, the similarity is the weapon that was used, and that was an AR-15. Uh, AR-15 was also used in this shooting. What do you make of that? Well, uh, AR-15s are modeled off of military weapons. They have the features that allow them to be particularly effective at assaulting a position, uh, uh, you know, offensively using a firearm. And you want that for your soldiers who are fighting abroad. Uh, but there really is no place for them at home. And what we're seeing, and the reason you're seeing these guns in, in so many mass shootings is because they are designed to kill as many people as possible, as fast as possible. They have the features, they have the um, uh, ammunition capacity, and they have the muzzle velocity to do just that. Um, what I make of it is that these uh, firearms have no place in civilian hands. Uh, and we think it's time for the federal government to reenact the assault weapons ban. You know, that was a law in the books for a decade and we were safer for it. Uh, it's time to, to reinstate the assault weapons ban in this country. How close are we to that happening, if at all? Because last night we did see a Democrat actually in Maine whose hometown is Lewiston have a change of heart. He said this. This is Democrat uh, Congressman Jared Golden. Quote, the time has now come for me to take responsibility for this failure, which is why I now call on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles. 
What do you make of his change of heart? And will we ever see that ban happen again? Well, I, you know, I wouldn't be in this line of work if I didn't believe we were going to see that happen again. I think we will. Um, and we appreciate Representative Golden uh, joining us in the call for an assault weapons ban. Look forward to working with him. Um, and, you know, it, unfortunately, it sometimes takes uh, tragedy to, to shock you out of complacency. I think that's what we saw with Representative Golden. Um, and it's important, though, to note that he is like so many others that have changed um, their tune on, on guns because they're just looking at the situation in their country, in their district, and saying, this is not acceptable. So, uh, you know, I really applaud that he, he uh, took, uh, he had the courage to really own uh, the mistake in his position, and I hope that others follow. You touched on the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act earlier, and President Biden signed that into law last year. I want to read some of um, what was included in, the, in that legislation, and if you think there are any other areas where Republicans and Democrats can work together. It encouraged states to enact red flag laws, enhances background checks for gun buyers under the age of 21, closes the so-called boyfriend loophole, and provided around $11 billion to improve mental health programs. Do we see any other room for bipartisanship when it comes to gun control? Absolutely. You know, this, this was an extraordinarily meaningful act, but it was by no means uh, the end of the story in Congress. And, and in fact, it's not the end of the story of bipartisan. Uh, action in Congress. When we look at Americans and their view on uh, gun policy, when we look at background checks and assault weapons ban and red flag laws, you see some, sometimes as high as 80, 85 percent support. And that means Democrats and Republicans, non-gun owners and gun owners alike all agree on this. So this is a very much a bipartisan issue. The change that needs to happen is in our leadership. And some are catching on that this is a bipartisan issue. This is a public health problem, not a political uh, disagreement. And we are seeing them you know, change their mind, change their tune, change their vote. Uh, we need more of it and we need it fast because we really can't afford to wait. Some people, largely Republicans, do say this isn't about guns. This is about mental health. It's about the person, not the weapon. House Speaker Mike Johnson, who was just elected into leadership this week, said this last night. At the end of the day, the problem is the human heart. It's not guns. It's not the weapons. What do you make of that type of thinking? Well, I, with all due respect to the new speaker, think it's a bit disingenuous. If he's got a plan to change American hearts, I'd love to hear it. Uh, mental health is a problem in this country. There's no doubt about it. That was one of the most meaningful parts of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act was so many resources going into mental health. But we're not the only country with mental health problems, right? Many Western countries, industrialized nations have mental health problems, bad ones. What they don't have access to is an arsenal so that when things really do go badly in their lives, when they do have a mental break, that the first thing they reach for is is a weapon designed to kill. That's the thing that makes us unfortunately uh, exceptional in this in this regard. It's not the mental health problem. It's the access to guns. This has been a national conversation now for years, and I've been talking to members of Congress now at Forbes about gun safety, gun measures in this country for over a year now. And it's almost like a copy paste just changed how many numbers of mass shootings there are, which is it's indescribably painful. That's how it is now. So what do you think needs to be added to this national conversation that you think is missing? Well, in, in one respect, I think it's got to be kind of more of the same. It's got to be more pressure, uh, more vocalization of, of, of Americans' beliefs. And, and, and some Americans are going to need to go to the polls and vote exclusively on guns because they are going to have to break with their party um, uh, if, if we're going to if we're going to make this change. But I do think that there's a lot of other voices out there that we are seeing joining the gun violence prevention movement. And, and those those. Uh, are really important, and one I think particularly relevant to to your publication is is, is business. Uh, business can take a business can say, you know what, mass shootings 
uh, not good for business, not good for the American economy, not good for the workforce, um, not good to attract international talent to come to this country. Increasingly, uh, people are not relocating here, not coming to school here like they used to because the pervasive gun violence problem just shocks their their conscience. So I think the business community is one really important one, but among other sectors that are getting involved, that are lending their voices. And you know, at the end of the day, when you do the straw poll on this, you just have the vast majority of Americans, of American business sectors, of all stripes supporting these laws. But we're going to have to keep pushing. We're going to have to get individuals getting involved get over the cynicism that is really understandable given the uh, inaction at the federal level in particular um, and, and, and make the difference that, w- that we can make. The Gun Violence Archive has that uh, right now that there have been 566 mass shootings in this country to date, just in 2023. We're not live right now, so obviously that number can change. That's more than one mass shooting a day. and. People say after a mass shooting, hey, now's not the time to get political. But there is there a time to get political because there are more than one a day? Well, I, I think you've got it exactly right. If we were to wait for a pause, we would never have the conversation. Um, so the time is always now. The time to act is now. The time to have the conversation is now. Um, and in, you know, to honor the victims of these mass shootings, we have a responsibility to act and swiftly. And what's your message to Congress and President Biden now in this wake of another tragedy? Well, it's the same as always. You know, you were elected to represent the American people and your principal job is to keep us safe. You're not doing that job. You need to pass laws that the American people want and it's it's time to, to act now. Nick Saplina, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate the important conversation. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.